Ah, uh, matrices. Rectangular tables full of numbers. They can be composed, decomposed, and transposed. But if you look more closely, you will see that a matrix isn't a rectangular table at all. It's a row that contains columns. Let's see what this is all about. First, a quick recap. A linear transformation takes a single input vector and produces a new vector as output. It does so in a linear way, which means that it distributes nicely over linear combinations. Geometrically, it keeps the origin in place and keeps straight lines straight and evenly spaced. After choosing a specific basis, the linear transformation is represented by a matrix. The numbers in the matrix are basis dependent, in a way that we will flesh out in this very video. When you move to a different basis, the numbers are going to change in a predictable way. We already saw what such a basis change looks like in an earlier video. It's a sandwich product, where the original matrix is sandwiched between the basis change matrix and its inverse. Because the crusts of the sandwich are each other's inverses, I call this pattern there and back again. There's an entire video if you want more. Now that we have the recap out of the way, let's talk about something totally unrelated. We are going to talk about vectors and dual vectors a lot, so make sure that you understand what they are. If necessary, you can check out the earlier videos we made. In this video and the next one, we will develop a kind of glue for sticking vectors and dual vectors together in order to construct larger objects from them. In today's video, we begin with the simplest case. We will stick a single vector and a single dual vector together. The glue is written as an operator that looks like a multiplication symbol in a circle. It doesn't really do much. It just keeps the two objects together. Of course, it also has some additional properties, but we will go into those in due time. For now, let's just ask, what does this new combined object do? Well, let's see. It has two parts. The dual vector part is also known as a one-form. We defined it earlier as a linear function that takes a vector as input and returns a real number. Now, the second part is a vector, and I want to convince you that it can also be seen as a function. It takes a dual vector as input and returns a real number. If you have a hard time seeing a vector as a function, please have a look at the previous video where I argue that in this matrix product between a row and a column, there is no fundamental reason why we should treat the row as an active function and the column as a passive list of numbers. They can both be seen as active, as functions. And so what we have done here with our multiplication in a circle symbol is glue two functions together. At this point you may think that the two parts of this new object are just going to eat each other, destroying the object in the process. I mean, the dual vector expects a vector as its input, and we have a vector sitting right next to it. So the whole thing could collapse into a real number. But that is not what happens. We have to imagine that the glue is strong enough to prevent the two parts from jumping on each other like that. I know I'm being ridiculously informal here, but I hope you get the point. The two parts of our new object can't use each other as input. Okay, taking stock, we have two functions that each expect an input, and we glue them together so that they still both expect an input. Your next reasonable guess might be that the resulting object is itself a function that expects two inputs. If that is what you guessed, congratulations. That's absolutely correct. We have constructed a binary function. It takes exactly one vector and one dual vector as input. And it produces a single real number in the end. This is what our mathematical glue is for. We use it to construct multi-input functions from single input ones. 
The resulting functions are always linear, just like the parts. So the summary so far is that we can create a big multi-input linear function from single input ones. How exactly does the combined function work? This is where we get a bit more rigorous, but don't worry, it's still pretty easy actually. The trick is to take the inputs one at a time. I will first feed the dual vector into our big function. It gets picked up by the vector part. The dual vector input and the vector part combine into some real number R1, which we just put at the front. The vector part of our function is now gone. What remains is a simple dual vector, also known as a one-form. And we already know that that's a function that takes a single vector as its input. And hey, what do you know? We still have an input vector left. We feed it to the dual vector and they combine to produce a second real number, R2. We put R2 at the front as well, where it multiplies with R1. This is the final answer. This is the output of the binary function after taking two inputs. I hope you see how it works. It's really useful to take the inputs one at a time. We can also take the inputs in the other order. It makes no difference. Here, let's do the first step. I promise you something really cool is about to happen. So we feed the vector into our bigger linear function first. What happens is that the dual vector part of our big function takes the input vector, eats it, and spits out a real number. What remains after this first step is the other part, which is a vector. Now hang on a minute. There's something oddly familiar about this. We have a big linear function. And when you give it a single vector, the result is a new vector. What the hell? That's exactly the definition of a linear transformation. The big function we have constructed is a matrix. Whoa, wait, this is too much. Back up. This seems to suggest that we can look at a matrix or a linear transformation in two different ways. Let's put those two ways side by side so that we can compare them. On the left we see a matrix as a linear function from vectors to vectors. That's how we have always been thinking about it in the past. The input is a single vector and the output is also a single vector. Simple, clear, done. On the right, we still see a matrix as a linear function, but this time it takes two inputs, a vector and a dual vector. The output this time is a real number. These two views seem completely contradictory. Which is it? Does a matrix take one input or two? Does it produce a vector or a real number? What a mess. The way out of this mess is to take the two inputs on the right, one at a time. This is a well-known technique in math and in software development. It's called currying. It says that whenever you have a function that takes two inputs and returns a thingamagog, you can always think of it as a function that takes only a single input. The way to make this work is to make this single input function return a new function. And that one takes the second input and turns it into the final thingamagog. This all takes some time to get used to. For me, the hardest part to wrap my mind around is the fact that we have a function that returns a function. There is something meta about this that makes it harder to grasp. So don't worry if it doesn't make sense right away. It's one of those things in math that you just get used to after a while. When we apply the currying technique to a matrix, we take the vector input first, and we expect this to return a new function that takes the second input. And yes, that really is precisely what happens. The output is a vector, which is indeed a function. And what does it take as its input? A dual vector. So it really does take the second input. 
its output, the final result, the thingamagog that pops out when the vector eats the dual vector, is the final real number. So, to summarize, a matrix can be seen either as a function that takes a vector and a dual vector and turns them into a real number, or as a function that takes a vector and turns it into another vector, which then takes the dual vector to produce the real number. The glue that we've been talking about is called the tensor product. Its entire goal is to produce large, multi-input functions from smaller parts. The parts and the final function are all linear. And the way it works is by taking the inputs one at a time. The many objects in linear algebra are geometric or even physical objects that don't care about your choice of basis. In a specific basis, a vector gets a list of coordinates, but those are only valid in that particular basis. The same is true for dual vectors and for matrices. What we want to find out next is what the tensor product looks like in a specific basis. The procedure is surprisingly simple. Take two tables of numbers. To calculate their tensor product, you multiply each number on the left with the entire table on the right. You put all of the resulting tables inside a larger table that has the same shape as the first input table. So when you tensor a 2 by 4 with anything else, the result will also be a 2 by 4, but its contents will be tables with the same shape as the second input table. At this point you could flatten the final table, removing all of its internal structure. But it's actually really useful to keep the structure around. Let's apply this procedure to the simple tensor product between a vector and a dual vector. We multiply each element of the row with the entire column, and we place the resulting columns in a row. If you flatten this thing, you get a traditional matrix. But let's not flatten it. Let's appreciate that a matrix is, and always has been, a row of columns. What happens when you feed a vector to our matrix? Well, the matrix itself is a row, so we can just apply the inner product between rows and columns. Just do what you always do. Multiply the elements of the row and the column pairwise, and add up the results. An inner product usually produces a real number, but this time the elements of the original row are themselves columns and so the result is a new column. And that's exactly what we expected. Our matrix has turned an input vector into an output vector. It has turned a column into a column. Everything still works precisely as before, but now with much more depth. You should now see more clearly why the matrix vector product is such a weird horizontal vertical number dance. That dance is just a consequence of the inner product and the internal structure of the matrix. When you transpose a matrix, it goes from a row of columns to a column of rows. And what does a column take as its input? In order to make the inner product work, the input should be a row this time, and we should place it on the left. That's why transpose matrices operate on dual vectors, not on vectors. See this video by Mathemaniac, which shows exactly what the transpose of a matrix is for. You can't even really define the transpose accurately without talking about dual vectors first. In the next video, we will use our tensor glue to produce other kinds of multi input objects. When you glue two dual vectors together, you get a row of rows. This is called a bilinear form, because it takes two input vectors and outputs a real number. We will get into the details next time, or you can already watch that video on Patreon. The point is that the internal structure of these nested tables tells you everything you need to know. Or, as Eigenchris puts it in his excellent series on tensor algebra, 
Once you understand how a tensor is composed from smaller parts, you get all of the products and the correct nesting of the tables and the variance behavior for free. Speaking of the variance behavior, how does a matrix transform when we move to a different basis? I will spare you the detailed calculations. You can find them in this video by the brilliant YouTuber Eigenkris. When you do the calculations, you will find that the matrix transforms in two opposite directions. That makes sense because the matrix contains two parts. A vector, which is contravariant, and a dual vector, which is covariant. The first transforms counter to the basis change, so it gets multiplied by the B matrix. But the dual vector part uses the F matrix. And so it makes total sense that their tensor product, the full matrix, needs both F and B, where F and B are still inverses of each other. When I first saw this, it put such a wide smile on my face that it almost hurt. Just look at this formula. Recognize it? It's the good old sandwich product that we've dedicated an entire video to. In that video I called this expression the there and back again pattern. The two sandwich crusts are each other's inverses because you first have to move to the new basis, do your thing there, and then come back. But now this pattern gets an additional layer of meaning. The crusts are each other's inverses because the matrix contains two parts that transform in opposite directions. The pattern makes the mixed variance of the matrix very explicit. I just love how this sheds new light on something we thought we already fully understood.